Hello, my name's Rich. I am the creator of Medieval History Buff. I blog and I create videos on medieval history. This is episode two of my mini podcast. And today I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Holy Roman Emperors from the 9th century that I've been blogging about. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about their reigns, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about them personality wise because I, I find them quite an interesting bunch now everyone knows a little bit about Charlemagne if they've studied medieval history in, in any great detail so we all know that Charlemagne's probably the most famous of all the Holy Roman Emperors but he was also on top of being a great warrior king and brilliant diplomatically and all that that comes with a strong kingship he was also he was also quite a, a family man which is probably something of a surprise if you've not studied him that closely he was um he was close to his children he liked to oversee their education and he didn't use his daughters in the way you might expect politically and that just shows you that he was quite he was a bit more nuanced than you might think and he wasn't just some barbarian who happened to be crowned emperor he was there was more to the man than just his achievements as a warrior his son and successor was louis the pious louis the pious was capable as a king but he was also quite weak as a man and he was dominated by his son Lothair he was twice deposed which is once is embarrassing twice is nothing short of a disaster never mind by your own son so when he died in 840 he left a potentially volatile situation between three of his remaining sons Charles the Bald in West Francia Louis the German in the East and Lothair, who would eventually become emperor in 843. Lothair was quite an, an ambitious man, I suppose you'd call it, but it was also self-serving and self-interested and greedy, frankly. And he sought to annex part of Charles's lands. Charles and Louis eventually defeated Lothair in 841 at the Battle of Fontenoy. And that chastised Lothair a little bit. He was crowned officially as emperor in 843 after the Treaty of Verdun. And his relations with Charles from that point onwards would improve slightly. And they'd, they'd be a bit more brotherly towards each other. Charles, ironically, would then have problems for the next few decades with Louis the German who had been on his side up to that point and in the 870s when Charles went to get himself crowned emperor in Italy Louis the German went out of his way to try and stop it and he was he was a thorn in Charles's side repeatedly throughout Charles's political career and it took Charles three t attempts to get rid of Louis the German's attempts to prevent him from being crowned emperor in 875. He sent his sons to do his dirty work, basically, but Charles drove them off every time. So Charles, you could say, was quite a... I think he was quite a strong man, and I think he was quite shrewd as well. He had to deal with the Vikings. Now, in 845, Paris was sacked. And to basically buy himself a bit of time, he paid them off. That's not necessarily a tactic I'd agree with too much. But because it simply didn't work, like, for instance, later on with Athelred the Unready. But 
he did buy himself a little bit of time and Charles, in fairness, did actually attempt to resist the Vikings militarily as well in a coordinated fashion, which Ethelred just didn't really. It was all chaotic with him. So Charles was quite... He was shrewd and he was patient. He had to for forbear quite a lot of trouble with his two brothers and actually his other brother as well, Pepin, who died a few years before Louis the Pious. Charles continued to show good diplomatic skills with his uh, brothers. Rather than fighting them, he would try and bring them to peace terms, but that all wouldn't always work because Lothair was headstrong and he was stubborn. And Louis the German was quite a fickle man and even if he had been brought to negotiations it can't be said that he wouldn't have gone back on his word anyway so charles out of the, all the emperors in the ninth century was probably the most likable apart from charlemagne and the most capable again apart from charlemagne so in 855 lothair died and he was succeeded as emperor by his son Louis the Second. Louis the Second was not a man with much patience either. He had a couple of rebellions against him, and he reacted in a particularly violent way. And he's been accused of raping nuns and murdering innocent people. And so his reputation is not particularly a good one. He did achieve. One of the most important events in the ninth century, he recaptured Barry from in Italy from the Muslim invaders. So he can't go without credit, but at the same time, personality wise, he had fatal flaws, a bit like his father. So a little bit later on, we go to Charles the Fat, who became emperor in 881. He was quite a weak-willed man, and he wasn't particularly assertive, and he was eventually deposed by his own nephew, Arnulf of Corinthia. So whether that can be put down to the fact he, for quite a long time, suffered from ill health, I think it probably did have an impact on him, and Arnulf of Corinthia did let him retire on on some lands in the, in the empire instead of actually having Charles eliminated, which he might well have done. So perhaps Arnulf knew that Charles was perhaps not ruling well because of reasons that were slightly beyond his control, but he's one of the weakest emperors in the story that I've done so far. Arnulf of Corinthia and Gaius Spoleto and Lambert are the three remaining emperors in the ninth century. Or I'm calling them emperors, even though there's some debate whether they actually were. Gaius Spoleto particularly does not leave much of an impact on European history, really. So I won't talk about him too much. His son Lambert was only 18 when he was murdered. And he, he kind of struggled to keep on, keep hold of power because of Arnulf of Corinthia, who was probably the most influential man in the empire at the time. But for some reason, after Charles the Fat died, Arnulf didn't make a move to become emperor. And so, and he didn't become emperor until 896. And that was after Gaius Spoleto had died a couple of years before. 
and Lambert was technically in power, although he was still only in his early early teens. So, why got um, Arnolf waited that long? I'm not entirely sure, but he certainly had a capability for ruling and he might well have left a, a bigger imprint on medieval history had he not had a stroke after he became emperor in 896. He kind of lingered on for another couple of years before he died in 899. And through that kind of that technicality, Lambert sort of clung on to power in Italy. And he he did have some success. He put down a military, uh, he put down a campaign against him and the, uh, he started to show signs of being able to stamp his authority, but he was eventually murdered in 898. So th those last three that I've just talked about there are quite obscure figures in medieval history. So I'll, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. But the next chapter is going to be, of my blog, is going to be on Berengar and then Louis the Blind. And then that will be the, uh, the the close of this kind of this first part of the story of the Holy Roman Emperors. emperors. And then we'll, we'll be moving on to the Etonian dynasty, which is going to be a lot more interesting. And I'll share more details with that in future podcasts.